Hi folks, um, I'm never entirely sure whether I should be saying good morning or uh, good afternoon because it just depends upon when you're watching this video. Uh, but regardless, can I just give you a warm welcome uh, to the Compton Baptist Thursday thought uh, for the day. It's not quite a formulated thought in my mind just yet, so instead I, I think today we'll just call it Rossi's Rambling Reverie. Um, we have alliteration there for you, Pastor. Um, the sun's out, so I, I thought I would take the opportunity of trying to record this outside. Um, hopefully the wind won't pick up too much uh, and we'll, we'll get through this okay with not too much background uh, noise. But let's just begin with a wee word of prayer. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, um, we just pray that the busyness of life, um, even in COVID restrictions, would just be put to one side. Uh, and for the next few moments um, that our focus and our attention would be on you and you alone. Uh, we just pray that you would be at the centre uh, of our thoughts uh, and that you would bless our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. So, almost a year ago, on the 23rd of March 2020, um, lockdown restrictions were announced by, of course, the UK and uh, Scottish governments. It's amazing to think that this time last year we were able to get in someone else's car and go for a lift. We were able to go to non-essential shops, go to the football. Um, I could stand next to someone on a train and, and not think anything of it. We could go to church. Um, and, and I even took going to the hairdressers for granted. Um, never again. So what a year we've we've had. Um, I think I said this before, but you know, I naively thought this lock, the original lockdown would, would only last a few weeks. Uh, and before you know it, we'd be back to, to life as it was before. And little did I know that, you know, 12 months later, I'd, I'd still be working from home, still be going out for my daily exercise, uh, still wearing a mask just to go and buy a loaf of bread. Uh, and still trying to work out how many chocolate digestives uh, a teenage boy can eat in one day. But of course lockdown uh, has been a very different experience for each of us. Um, some of us are tiggers. You know, we, we've seen the benefits of going to work in our slippers, uh, of not having to rush about between meetings and appointments. Um, and we've really enjoyed the, the change of pace. Um, some of us are Eeyores. Uh, and we've perhaps been frustrated uh, at the limitations placed upon our ability to meet family and friends. Uh, go on holiday, go for a meal. And whether we're a, a Tigger or an Eeyore, some of us have just sailed calmly uh, through this storm, yet others of us have been left battered and bruised uh, by the constant crashing of the waves. And a question I've, I've heard asked a lot across this past year is, what is God doing in this? What, what is God possibly doing through uh, COVID? Or something similar. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've heard people ask it. And I am not going to attempt uh, to answer that question. Um, but I have been reflecting um, on how some of God's humble servants may have responded to the question, what is God doing uh, in all of this? Um, if you have your Bibles with you, I'm just going to, there are a, a, just a few verses uh, I was just going to look at this morning. And, and the first is in Genesis 40. And at the end of Genesis 40, you know, it, it comes right after Joseph has interpreted the dreams uh, for the cupbearer and the baker. And this is how Genesis 40 ends and 41 begins. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Two full years. Two years of Joseph kicking his heels. Can you imagine? Innocent, forgotten by the cupbearer. Now, did Joseph ask God what was going on? I'm pretty sure he did. But I'm also sure that God sustained Joseph through it all. Because a few chapters later, Joseph is able to say to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good 
to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I love that phrase, eh, the, the saving of many lives. And then as I, as I thought about Joseph eh, spending a couple of years in, in prison, of course the Apostle Paul then comes to mind. Um, and we, we get these verses in Acts eh, 24. I should probably have looked that up um, before I announced it. But at the end of 24, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Another servant of God imprisoned for two years. Coincidence? With God? I think not. I'm sure if I was around at the time, I would have asked God, God, what are you doing? What, what are you doing in this? What purpose does it serve the gospel for Paul to be in prison? It makes no sense. Surely he's better out preaching and teaching your word. Yet, in lockdown, Paul writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. And we get these amazing verses uh, in Philippians 4, uh, 11 to, to 13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be um, in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. God is constantly uh, turning human logic and understanding upside down, isn't he? An order that has uh, perfect purposes and plans may be fulfilled. Now Paul had his eyes firmly fixed on his Lord and Saviour, who he knew would sustain and strengthen him in every situation he faced. It, it reminds me of, that, of a great uh, Spurgeon quote, you know, God does not need your strength. He has more than enough of his own. He asks your weakness. He has none of that. I'm sure many of you will know the story of Amy Carmichael, um, the missionary from County Down uh, in Northern Ireland, who did so much work spreading the gospel uh, in India in the late 1800s and early 1900s. At the age of 66, she had a bad fall and therefore had to spend the remaining years of her life, another 16 or 17 years, pretty much bedridden. And again, we'd ask God, God, what are you doing? Another obedient servant, not able to be out spreading your word. And yet, and yet, from bed, Amy was able to write a further 16 books, reaching and inspiring four more, far more people to live for God than she had done previously. God always has a purpose. God always has a plan. Part of my uh, daily devotional reading plan has, has recently begun through the book of uh, Job. And um, I know it's not everyone's favourite cup of tea, but actually there's so much depth and, and richness uh, contained within that. Uh, and I'm again, just as I've been reflecting on Joseph and, and Paul, it does bring to mind Job and, and he wanted God, he wanted to stand before God and, and ask God for an explanation as to why he had suffered. Um, he wanted to know what God was doing, but as soon as God speaks, Job is reminded of God's power and majesty to the extent that he, he simply says um, in response to God in chapter 42, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. In the end, Job doesn't get to know 
God's purpose. He realises that he doesn't need to know God's purposes though. He's not equipped with the intellect or reasoning to understand God's ways. But Job does get to know more of God as God reveals more of himself to Job. Job's trust and fear of God grows, as does his love and obedience. So, as we near what we all pray is the end eh, of lockdown and easing of restrictions, and people ask, what is God doing? Well, I think in all likelihood, he's been doing what he's always done, and that is to seek ways of drawing people into a closer and deeper and more meaningful relationship with him. And as Joseph would say, the saving of many lives. I think though for me, and perhaps for you, the real question that I should ponder and reflect on is how has my faith grown in this past year? Like Joseph or Paul or Amy Carmichael, have I still sought to serve the Lord wholeheartedly each and every day and the different situations eh, and circumstances that God has placed me? Have I learned to be content with the situation God has placed me in because I am focused on him and him alone? And that's not meant to eh, diminish any of the hard times or suffering eh, that some of us have gone through. If there's any sense in which we delight in suffering, it's that we delight to follow the Lord Jesus who himself suffered. Even Christ did not delight in sufferings. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith was the one who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So have I, or, or have we, been alert and attentive to all that God has been saying and teaching us this year? Have I, have we learned to lean on him and find that contentment that Paul speaks of? To close, I thought I would just read the words of a, a Methodist covenant prayer. It kind of uh, fits in with this, I think. So let's pray together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.